All right, here we are, lesson number seven. And in this second to last lesson of this unit, we're going to investigate the conservation of energy. We already investigated the conservation of momentum. Um, and here we're turning our attention to a very similar conservation law, but a little bit, a little bit different in a, couple, in a couple of ways. The conservation of energy, of course, is very well known. We studied it in grade 11, but we had limits on what we could do in grade 11. We couldn't deal with friction in grade 11. We couldn't deal with springs in grade 11. So those are the new additions, of course, now that you've seen kind of the potential energy that we're talking about. And simply put, it states that energy can't be created or destroyed. Right? It can only be transferred from one form to another. And we're going to investigate the conservation of energy in grade 12 by looking at conservative forces, so gravity and springs and all kinds of stuff, and also non-conservative forces like friction. The conservation of energy is very, very close in nature to the work kinetic energy theorem. Okay, And you'll see similarities when we start doing this. We just take a slightly different approach in our problem solving. But really, they're very, very similar concepts. For a moment, let's take a look at some examples of conservative forces and non-conservative forces because a conservative force is one where the work that's done is independent of the path taken. Okay, So we know that if I move an object from one position to another position and we're talking about gravity, as long as that initial height and the final height are the same, the amount of work done to move it from A to B is going to be the same, no matter what path I take. And so examples of this type of, um, of a force, of this type of a conservative force would be gravity. It would also be the spring force. And even another one would be the electric force. And we haven't talked about the electric force yet, but that's coming soon in our next unit. And so we leave it here as kind of like uh, a way for you to consider, okay, so we are going to be dealing with the conservation of energy when it comes to the electric force. Non-conservative forces, though, depend on the path that's taken. And so a very good example is you can say, okay, well, if we consider friction, if we have a longer path over which friction is acting, more energy is going to be taken out of the system. And so that is an example of where work that's being done is dependent on the path it's taken. And of course the two examples that we would say here are work and uh, friction, excuse me, and air resistance. So this is kind of to give you a general idea about what we're talking about. And you'll see why this is important when we solve some problems. So here's example one. A ball of mass 0 0.5 kilograms is thrown downwards at a speed of 2.5 meters per second from an initial height of 70 meters. If we neglect air resistance, determine the velocity of the ball at a height of 22 meters. This is a very typical grade 11 problem where really we're looking at the conservation of energy between gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy. Because we're talking about speeds and we're talking about velocities, but we're also talking about heights. So the way that we basically set this up is to observe what we have. We know we have mass, we've got V1, we've got height 1, we've got height 2. And so we would say that the energy that this system has initially is equal to the energy that it has finally. And we can, of course, go through and say, well, what type of energy does this system have initially? Well, we know it's a ball, it has mass, and it's up at a height of 70 meters. So it's got some gravitational potential energy, but it's also thrown. And it's thrown with a speed of 2.5 meters per second, which means it has some kinetic energy to begin as well. The second half of the problem says, okay, well, what's the velocity of the ball? So we're looking for a kinetic energy component. What's the velocity of the ball at a height of 22 meters? So it's still got a height, so it's still got some gravitational potential energy with respect to the ground. And so if we take zero, if we take the ground as being zero, then we can sub in these numbers here. You'll notice that because mass appears as a common factor, 
on both sides of the equation, here and here, and here and here, we can simply factor out mass, right? And it, it, it divides as a common factor on both sides. You have to be very careful with this practice because you won't always be able to cancel out your mass. And, and very, very often I will see students that'll cancel and we, when, they're, when you're really not supposed to. And you'll see an example of that in a moment. But here, if we do the mathematics, and we simplify some of these terms, and we rearrange, and then we solve, we get that V2 is equal to 31 meters per second. Of course, that would be in the downwards direction. And so we basically solve for the speed of this ball at a height of 22 meters. And that is, in a nutshell, a classic kind of grade 11 introduction to the conservation of energy. And that's why we did it first. So let's make things a little bit more challenging. And we're going to go to example number two. All right, so now we introduce a plane, right, or a ramp. And we have a three kilogram crate, and it slides down a ramp. The ramp is one meter in length. It has an angle of inclination of 30 degrees. And we've got a little diagram of it here. The crate starts from rest and experiences a constant frictional force of five newtons. So we're not going to worry about calculating the normal and stuff like that. We're not going to worry about that. We're just saying that the force of friction is five newtons. So let's use energy methods to determine the speed of the crate at the bottom of the ramp. Because if we were going to use forces, we would need to do a free body diagram and we'd need to create um, find the acceleration, we need to do kinematics. So this would be a pretty good lengthy example. Whereas here, we can use energy, and you'll notice that it might actually be a lot more efficient. So here's the way that we're going to adjust our conservation of energy formula. And you'll see that we've got the basic energy initial equals energy final. But because friction is going to take energy away from what the system has initially, we need to add this extra term, and we need to add it to this side. We could also think about this as, okay, the energy that it has initially minus the work that's done because of friction along the incline, that would be equal to the final energy as well. And so this is the way that we're going to modify our conservation of energy formula. Of course, the energy that it has initially is gravitational potential energy because the ramp is up the incline. It's at an, it's at an increased elevation to where it will end, which is down here at the bottom of the ramp. And so the energy that it has initially is simply gravitational potential. Now we're going to have to do a little bit of legwork to find out what this h is, but you'll see that in a moment. At the bottom of the ramp, it's got some speed. And of course, it's got this piece where it's lost some friction because of its descent along the ramp. It's lost, it's lost some energy, excuse me, because of the friction along the ramp. So here, mass is of course 3, and we've got uh, g, which is our standard 9.8. But to find out what this h is, well, we know that this is a 1 meter ramp. We know it's inclined at an angle of 30 degrees, so a quick little trig will give us this sine 30 times 1.0. That's the height right there. And that's just a little Sakatoa um, opposite over hypotenuse um, to get what this height is. Equals 1 half times 3 times v squared plus the force of friction multiplied by, or the dot product with, the displacement over which this crate rolls down the slide or slides down the slide. And of course, because the friction acts, the friction is 5 newtons, and because it acts over a displacement of 1 meter from here down to here, this is the work that's done by friction. You will notice very carefully in this question, your masses are not a common factor. They do not cancel out, because in this term, force times displacement, there is no mass. Okay, so the masses do not cancel. And so here we would not be able to cross out the three kilograms. So solving this and simplifying and moving numbers around, we get that the velocity 
or the speed of the crate at the bottom of the ramp is 2.54 meters per second. Okay? <clears throat> this question right here has a block and a mass, right? Or two blocks, I guess you could call them. One of them is 6 kilograms, one of them is 4 kilograms. The block with a mass of 6 kilograms, which is up here, is on a horizontal surface, and it's connected to this spring. The spring has a constant of 1.0 times 10 to the 2 newtons per meter. The system is released from rest. The spring is not stretched. This hanging block, it has a mass of 4 kilograms, and it falls a distance of 30 centimeters before coming to rest again. This is what we need to do. We need to calculate the coefficient of friction between the block and this surface. And what you're going to do is you're going to use the concepts that were illustrated in example number two to deal with friction. And you're going to try this question. I would recommend you do it now. Give it a try. And we will solve this in class together in our next session. There's the answer, just in case you want to check.